It's day 13 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Welcome back, friends. Today, we are hearing the last of the wordy words of Elihu as he continues in his exaggerated speech, but then reroutes back to the greatness of God. Now, if you are back for more, if you are a part of this group, if you feel like it's a part of your life, can you help us out by hitting that like button, just partnering with us? Or if you are new here, we welcome you. Let us know where you are in the world, where you're watching from, and make sure to check out the show notes or the description box for all of the information regarding this Bible study. We are studying from the ESV translation by Crossway, and I do have a link to my Bible in the description box below. We also have a website, heartdive.org, where you can find even more information. Everything is at your fingertips in one place, so make sure you bookmark that in your browser so that you can always access that rather quickly. Otherwise, we are getting into Job chapters 35 through 37 today, so let's prepare our hearts as we get into the reading. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We love you so much. We just thank you. Thank you so much for this weekend of being able to rest, to catch up on the reading of the Word, to just be in your presence to be still. I just pray, Lord, that if anybody didn't get that chance, that you will refresh their spirit right now, that there will be a supernatural rest that is bestowed upon every single person here. Please, Lord, as we get into your word, the reading of it, the daily manna, may we be open to hear your voice, to be able to see your face, and to receive everything that you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for the new mercies that are available to us each and every day. We know that you have a great purpose for our lives, and so I just pray that we're ready for it and that we'll be willing to step out in faith and to act in obedience to everything that you call us to. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and also help us to forgive those who have come against us or hurt us. I pray that we won't hold on to that, Lord, but we will let it go to be able to live in your freedom today. Please don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue here in chapter 35 with Elihu condemning Job. And Elihu answered and said, Do you think this to be just? Do you say it is my right before God that you ask, What advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? So he's like, Do you actually think you're right here, Job? Do you really think that you would have been better off sinning? Because remember, he thinks that Job is in that place of getting what he deserved. Verse 4, I will answer you and your friends with you. Well, the funny thing is, is he doesn't say anything to the friends because he's actually in agreement with them. Look at the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness concerns a man like yourself and your righteousness, a son of man. So he's saying God is way too great to be affected by anything that you do, but your sin will affect others around you. Because of the multitude of oppressions, people cry out. They call for help because of the arm of the mighty. So basically when things are bad, that's when people cry out to God. But none says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the heavens? So while he said people call on God while things are bad, they don't do so whenever things are good. And I thought, well, that's a heart check right there. Do you call on God in both the good times and the bad? Is your communion with him constant? Verse 12, there they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. Surely God does not hear an empty cry, nor does the Almighty regard it. So he's implying that Job's prayers perhaps weren't righteous. And he's like, you need to humble yourself, Job, because he ain't going to listen to you otherwise. How much less when you say that you do not see him, that the case is before him and you are waiting for him. So he's saying, be patient, Job, and you'll see. And now because his anger does not punish and he does not take much note of transgression, Job opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. So he ends here by saying, you have misunderstood God and you are therefore speaking nonsense. Now he makes a little shift here to speak about the greatness of God in chapter 36. And Elihu continued and said, bear with me a little and I will show you. And I couldn't help but think, I wonder if the people are getting a little shifty in their seats, like rolling their eyes in the crowd, like get on with it, say what you got to say, make your point already. For I have yet something to say on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from afar and ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in his knowledge is with you. (laughs) Yikes. 
Wow, I don't know that even if I did feel like I knew everything, if I could say that I was perfect in knowledge and that everything I know is from God. Verse 5, Behold, God is mighty and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. So he's like, God is almighty, but he ain't a bully. He's only going to give to people what they deserve. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with the kings on the throne, he sets them forever and they are exalted. So he promotes the righteous. And if they are bound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they are behaving arrogantly. So he's saying, he will convict you. He will show you your wrongs, which that is true. We know that. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. So he calls people to repentance. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity. So some could say, here we go again with that prosperity gospel talk. Elihu is claiming that if we simply listen and serve God, then all of our days will be lived out in prosperity. And while this can be true, it's definitely not an absolute. Or is it? I mean, it really depends on how you view prosperity, whether that is based on worldly wealth and good health and abundance of possessions, or do you look at it as like a growing faith, joy, peace, and hope that comes from God? I think that's interesting. So let's do a heart check. How do you view prosperity? And do you feel that if you listen to God and obey Him, that you will indeed receive it? Verse 12, but if they do not listen, they perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The godless or the hypocrites in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. So in other words, they are resentful. So he's kind of calling Job a hypocrite here because of the fact that Job has been denying his wrongdoing and he is implying that Job has rejected God. They die in youth and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. He also allured you out of distress into a broad place where there was no cramping. So God's been trying to teach you, Job. And if you learn your lesson, he will indeed deliver you is what he's saying. And what was set on your table was full of fatness. Verse 17, but you are full of the judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Well, that is wrong because Job is not wicked. So he is not full of that judgment. Beware lest wrath entice you into scoffing and let not the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. So he's saying, don't be distracted by your riches. Don't get misled by them. Will your cry for help avail to keep you from distress? He's like, do you really think that you crying for help is going to bail you out? It's not there for you or all the force of your strength. Do not long for the night when peoples vanish in their place, or in other words, they sleep away their sorrow. Take care, do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen rather than affliction. So he's saying, This is your fault. You're already in hot water, so you better stop sinning. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed for him his way? Or who can say, You have done wrong? So he's like, You cannot correct the teacher. Again, in a sense, this is true, but not fully applicable to Job. Now, if you know what God says to Job in the next few chapters, you will know that he kind of says this same thing. Verse 24, remember to extol his work or to praise him of which men have sung. All mankind has looked on it. Man beholds it from afar. Behold, God is great and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. So he's speaking about God transcending space, time, and understanding. So he's so much greater than you know. For he draws up the drops of water. They distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of his pavilion? Behold, he scatters his lightning about him. Behold, he scatters his lightning about him and covers the roots of the sea. For by these he judges peoples, he gives food in abundance. He covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. And I stopped here on this because I thought, okay, well, we talked about whether or not Satan was given authority to be able to control the weather. And there were some people who said, I don't believe that Satan has any control over the weather, that God is completely sovereign. So who was it? Was it God alone who struck the sun's house and burned it down? Or was it Satan who had the authority to be able to do that? Well, never Nevertheless, what we've got to remember is that 
God is sovereign and in control of all things. Even if he gives authority even to us or Satan, it is still ultimately up to him and whether or not he is going to let that authority be effective or to rule. It's crashing declares his presence. The cattle also declare that he rises. Now, while Elihu's intent is to squash Job into repentance by basically comparing his feeble nature to the majesty of God, the best thing that we can do is to look for the good or to look for the heartbeat of God, which I've been talking about, even in the midst of the dark times or the bad things, because he does do an incredible job at illustrating God's wisdom and power through the creation and through the weather. But these things are so often overlooked whenever we are constantly consumed with our own dealings in life. So heart check, how often do you reflect on the majesty of God, our creator? And he will continue speaking on his majesty here in chapter 37. And these are the final words of Elihu. At this also, my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven, he lets it go and is lightning to the corners of the earth. After it, his voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, to downpour his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man, that all men whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance. Now, this word guidance here is a nautical term meaning steering, which portrays God as basically a wise captain of our lives and of the world to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or or for his land, or for love, he causes it to happen. So Elihu is talking about the purpose and everything that God does. And this in particular is speaking about the purpose of storms. And so when we look at what he is saying that God will do through the storm, he will use it to punish or correct. He will use it to nourish the land and he will supply the needs of the people. And I thought about that because, you know, in Hawaii, whatever it rains a whole lot, if a storm comes through, it is the most glorious thing. Once the sun does come out and you look at the mountains, especially the ones that often sit bare or brown or dried out, and they're so lush and so beautifully green that you can't help but be like, wow, God. But even through the rain, he supplies the needs of the people. Those of us in the desert totally get that. We welcome the rain here because we need the water. We're always in constant drought. So you can look at storms as a bad thing, but you can also find the good in them as well. They are both seen in the Bible as judgment and a blessing. Verse 14, hear this, O Job. So he's like, are you listening here, Job? Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know how God lays his command upon them and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. So it seems as though he's trying to make a point here that Job has very limited understanding or knowledge of God. And through his do you know questions, I'm like, do you know him, Elihu? <laughs> Can you, like him, spread out the skies, hard as cast metal mirror? Now, mind you, mirrors back then were unbreakable. They were usually polished bronze. Teach us what we shall say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. Shall I be told him that I would speak? Did a man ever wish that he would be swallowed up? So he's like, I would never question him. And now no one looks on the light when it is bright in the sky. So no one looks at the sun. No one would be foolish enough to do that. When the wind has passed and cleared them, out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. The Almighty, we cannot find him. So he's elusive. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness. He will not violate. Therefore, men fear him. And this, he does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. So Elihu ends his celebration of God's majesty as our all-powerful creator with a call for all to fear God. And if you're new to the Bible, this can raise a lot of questions. What does it mean to fear God? Does this mean I should be scared of him? 
Well, no, it doesn't, because the Hebrew word for fear here is actually yare or yaira, which contextually means to be in awe or to have reverence and to be in wonder of who God is. It's actually recognizing how small we are in comparison to our great God. And yes, once we are face to face with that reality of this, there really should be a natural fear, some of that, but in a healthy way. And in fact, we will later read about people in the Bible who literally fall to their faces in fear whenever they were met with the glory or the presence of God. But in God's good nature, He was always right there to comfort them in the midst of it. And this is why we have to understand the fullness of God as best as we can. So heart check, what is your view of God? What characteristics stand out the most? And I had a whole lot of heartbeats of God written down in the margins of my Bible. And if you don't know what I'm speaking about, this is just looking for the goodness of God throughout your reading, especially in those chapters that seem so hard to get through or where we don't understand. You can pick out little things. And even if it doesn't explicitly state it, you can look at something and be like, oh, that reminds me that God is blank. And so that is what I'm doing. And I write them down. I put a little heart next to it. So if you take a look at my Bible, Bible notes, if you download them, it's in the show notes or the description box, you will see what I'm talking about. And maybe I should do a video on that. If you want to see a video on how I extract the heartbeat of God from my reading, let me know. Maybe we'll, we'll put that on the list of something to do later. But I hope you were able to see God's heart throughout this chapter. So let's take a look at some of the deep dive questions. Do you believe that our actions will affect God? In, in what ways? How do you reconcile God's sovereignty, meaning His reign or control over all things, and how we choose to live in response to that? Does it really matter? Do you believe that repentance can lead to a prosperous life? And in what ways? And are you able to perceive the infinite wisdom and power of God? Are you accepting of our inability to perfectly understand it? And does God's power and sovereignty bring you comfort in hard times? So Heavenly Father, your infinite wisdom and your awesome ways are indeed beyond our ability to understand. We know this and we do recognize that who you are and what you do transcends our limited ability to be able to comprehend it. But while we may not fully know the why or the how, what we do know is that you love us, that you are just and that you are gracious and that you are merciful. So I pray that we will gain a better understanding every single day of who you are, but never try to rise above your majesty. Forgive us, Lord, where we have doubted your goodness or questioned your actions. Help us to be a people who don't only call on you whenever things are bad, but constantly come before you with the desire just to be in relationship with you, especially in times of success or prosperity. May we never lose sight of you as the giver of every good thing in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, where we have taken that for granted. And I pray that we will be able to see your face in the midst of every aspect of nature, recognizing your awesome design and your purpose in all of it. And may we heed the call today to maintain our humility before you and to always live in reverence and awe and wonder, knowing just how small we are in the midst of your greatness. We praise you in all of it. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, 
and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.